go. Go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Super Tuesday. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. Hello. Hi. Good to have you here. Super Tuesday. We had to raise the energy in the room. It was very low before the cameras came on. Got to kick it into gear. About ready to do bonsai. It, is, it has been an exhausting, exhausting past couple of days. Uh, we had a great group of students in the uh, workshop this weekend. Smaller numbers due to the pandemic, all good. Masks all day long, yikes, but we got to do it, is what it is. Uh, but we had a stellar kind of return to in-house education. I love students. I love having you all here um, and getting to kind of carry that momentum into the week. We had a monster day yesterday. Everybody's trying to recover, but we are here together now live, and I'm super pumped about it because we've got a little bit of a special piece here. Deviation from the Instagram post. If you saw, I'll tell you why in a minute, but we got Eve on the mic this evening. Hi, everyone. Josh is in the mothership uh, producing, doing what he does, dancing, uh, wearing cool <laughs> socks, and probably <laughs> drinking a cold beer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the floor is shaking. <laughs> Lonnie's on the detail cam, and Jesus is on the detail cam. Whoa. I wanted to come back to this. So basically, um, you know, I, Chris and Lisa, Telperian Farms, I think the GoFundMe campaign was wildly successful. Thank you to the Mariah community for contributing and helping them out. They have been a very big uh, partner in this boneside growth in the Pacific Northwest as well as in North America. I think they've inspired a lot of people to cultivate and grow trees at a higher level, level internationally um, from the recognition and quality that they've produced. And uh, we wish Chris and Lisa the best. And when that whole thing happened, um, Chris called me the morning that his house burned down. He said, and we lost Telperian Farms, which was a crazy phone call as I was driving through Omaha, Nebraska to receive. Uh, and he said, there's no irrigation. Um, you know, the, 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 the conditions are very, very poor. If, if you can come down here and grab some trees and save them, we would, you know, have at it. They're, they're, they're not gonna make it if you don't. Uh, so I called Troy on the phone. I said, Troy, I just got a call from Chris Kirk, uh, Telperian Farms burned down, and uh, they can't keep their trees alive. And, and so is there any way we can get down there? And Troy talked to Ryan Kaufman, who is the mastermind behind all of the uh, wonderfully packaged goods that you received from Mirai. And, uh, and Kaufman and Troy put together a U-Haul, and, uh, and Kaufman went down there uh, to Telperion the day after it had caught fire and, and burned. And he's got some really kind of jarring video footage from it uh, that doesn't really need to be seen. It's just really unfortunate. But he was able to save uh, maybe 20 trees is what he was able to, to, to bring out of there. I know Andrew Robson and Matt Reel were also able to save some material, um, and I think Chris and and the community around Telperion has kind of tried to go back in as they have access um, to be able to see what they can salvage in the field or in the containers, you know, that, that weren't rescued. Anyways, <clears throat> this white pine was a piece of one of the trees that Kaufman salvaged. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 like a, it's like a bittersweet moment because you have this, this remnant or this continuation of, 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 of some really respected and cherished people's passion uh, who contributed to our bonsai community. So to get to be able to take part in the styling of this tree, I think, is a really awesome opportunity to share with the community. And inside of it, right, inside of it, we still get to deal with all of those conundrums that we encounter uh, when we start to deal with field-grown pines. Now, we did the trunk bending on the big, massive Telperian Scots pine probably were a little bit ambitious with that. Tree's root system was not readily established. I rushed it. That tree did not survive that operation. But coming back and just recognizing, hey, it wasn't the, the, the action that caused the failure. It was the uh, lack of preparation or lack of patience on my part that I do firmly believe as we autopsy the tree after it had perished, uh, the root system was very underdeveloped, which is to say I obstructed it enough that no new roots were produced. And if a tree is not growing, a tree is dying. Uh, case in point with that tree. Uh, 
I believe in the wedge cutting technique. I believe in the proactive approach to cultivating health. Um, and so we're gonna use, instead of transitioning the tree to a bonsai container and giving it the, the roughly two years it needs to experience that kind of really rigorous work and have the root system to support it, I'm gonna take the, uh, 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 the, the opportunity here, while it's very solid and stable in this nursery can um, and is still with all of its field soil on and make the big trunk bending move on this white pine tonight come back to the strategy, come back to the execution, and let me go ahead and just kind of rotate. Now you see that we have a really beautiful base here that exists, great radial spread, um, wonderful distribution, and one of the tree species that we're always getting uh, requests to address and talk about is the white pine. This is a true Pinus parviflora, um, grown at Telperian Farms, and it has that quintessential base, it has that really wonderful, beautiful nabari and root spread. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take out just these stubs, because these stubs are right in the region where I am considering potentially uh, performing the trunk bend. Now we've got to decide on the angle that gives us the best base and the best lower portion of the trunk. So we start to maximize that movement and that is going to help inform and encourage us to have a little bit more in intentional uh, application of the trunk bend to execute that design. So let me just go ahead. I want to make sure these stay nice and small because we are going to be cutting. You'll see that the cut's going to come somewhere probably in here, but we don't know until we find that angle. So again, let me go ahead and let me just rotate here. Okay, now before we begin, as you're kind of getting a feel for this, as I'm getting rid of a lot of the stuff that I feel, when I go about the trunk bending process, the last thing I wanna do is leave some big saw cut or some big uh, operation that I have to perform on the upper portion of the tree after I've successfully bent this thing. Um, so we've gotta kind of make a, a, a very major decision as to how we handle this stump at the very top here. Right, we've got that cut site here. We've got a big cut site here. We have three kind of big branches coming out of that node. We will take it down to two tonight. We wanna think about water distribution up that trunk. We wanna think about resource distribution up that trunk. And we definitively wanna make sure when we make a big trunk, uh, trunk bend like this and we're gonna cut a wedge out of this trunk that we have a branch facilitating the linear movement of sap on the back side of that cut. So we take out that wedge, we need to be driving sap flow and a lot of energy through the back side of that bend. Because when we take that and we bend that and we stretch that tissue on this back side, as long as we have resources pulling through that, and especially at this time of year where we're going to be getting a lot of vascular productivity, that is how we rapidly heal, hold that, and ensure that the tree is gonna move through this operation with a lot of success, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna play with angles here, I'm gonna pitch you some different ideas. We'll talk about the location for the bend, the strategy for the bend, the anchoring of the bend, et cetera. I'm gonna open it up to questions as I just explore. I'll toss you those ideas. You can help me make decisions and let's go ahead and design this together. Awesome, all right, uh, let's see. Uh, first, we've got a couple questions about Telperian Farms. Um, let's see, do you know what your knowledge is on the future of Telperian? We all love the place very much and they believe that they're all yearning to hear what's going on and how we can help. They are a pillar of Pacific Northwest Bonsai. Mm. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, the, the conversations and I, I think it's probably uh, a little bit preemptive to start speaking with Chris, you know, like, Hey, are you gonna, you gonna start growing trees again? You know, like, he's like, <laughs> I, I can't imagine what that feels like. Like we were scared. A lot of the Mirai community checked in, which we very much appreciate. Um, we were scared that there was a lot of opportunity for fire to happen around Mariah as well. It was extremely, extremely dry. Um, and inside of that, you know, like uh, I can't imagine what it feels like to actually experience that and, and, and probably, um, I guess, just assume that it's tough to ask him right now what his future holds as he's kind of grappling with, with what he's dealt with. But we'll, you know, at some point, I'm sure when Chris is, is, is ready, he'll, he'll probably, you know, form some opinion on what he's going to do. Um, here's, here's one option for you, okay? And this is, I would say, when we look at this piece of material, a very traditional piece of material, nice and small. And I'm thinking this, if this could be a chuhin, really beautiful traditional Japanese black pine, really nice movement. And we start to think about that. Where do we and how do we conceptualize a trunk chop? or not a trunk chop, excuse me, a wedge cut and a bending of the trunk. I'm ultimately looking at a bending of the trunk 
where I have a natural bend already occurring. Now, what most people think is I'm gonna bend, I'm gonna bend this right here in this straight section, right? I'm gonna bend it right here because there's no movement there, so I have this movement, and then I'm gonna bend here. But I would actually say you are gonna get far more play out of a trunk bend. On a trunk this size, if you try to bend a straight section, the most you're gonna get is just a slight, even with the most extreme angle, you're gonna get a slight bend at the most out of that straight section. But if we start looking here, or we start looking here, where we already have a pronounced area under uh, extension and a pronounced area under compression, we take the wood out of this area and we bend, now all of a sudden the, the severity of that bend starts to create something very special. Now we've also talked about the fact that when we think about a trunk bend and conceptualize a trunk bend via the wedge cut model for a pine, applicable to all species of pine, okay? When we start to talk about this, we really wanna make sure that wherever that angle is, we have a fairly significant and pronounced length above that. A pronounced length above that location that we're gonna chop so that we have the leverage to be able to apply that force to that area that we're gonna bend and, and be able to get that application of force to actually move the trunk, as well as a longer area above that so that we make sure that when we perform that bend, you get that real extreme angle occurring at that location, okay? So that location, when I start to look, I'm thinking, okay, I could go here, I could go here, and at the very highest, I could go right here. Now, at this position, if I go right here, I have a relatively short lever arm, if I go right here, I'm gonna see a very minimal amount of bend. And if I make the chop right here, right at this node where I have these branches, I'm gonna be stretching right at a shoulder or a collar of growth, okay? So when we start to think about that collar of growth and we're thinking about kind of how all of that functions and how all of that behaves, those collars of growth are where that tearing is going to occur, okay? The only thing we need to make sure of right now is do we like the base and do we like the movement from here? I would say this is option number one. Let's go ahead and focus in, drop that camera down a little bit for me. And Josh, bring us in tight. Okay, option number one. Feels very, very strong to me. Feels very strong. Great buttress right here, great flare right here, great foreground. We've got roots in the background that I've uncovered. You can kind of see some of those blonde tones feels like it works really well, okay? I see that as an option number one. Now, there's an option number two. I'm gonna present it to you and you can let Eve know. I know there's some other questions. I'll come back to it. Sorry, I cut you guys off. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna continue rotating. Now, I don't want this to become horizontal, so I'm staying just past horizontal, but we do push the tree further to the left. It raises this nabari on the right side up quite a bit, okay? But it gives a little bit more slant here, a little bit more slant here, does start to, to kind of flirt with a little bit more horizontal. Here's what else is happening. As we take this trunk line and we move it further this way, if we're gonna be bending it back this way, we have farther to go. If we're here, we go to perpendicular and then we go past perpendicular, that is a large amount of movement to be able to get this trunk to move without the bottom side tearing out, right? So the more that we rotate this way, the more we take that line this way, the farther we've got to bend to get it past that perpendicular this way, okay? So there is more flow here. We're kind of right at the boundary right here, or we go back to that kind of initial, a little bit more upright, a little bit more pronounced, and maybe even a little bit more formal uh, display of that trunk, and we have already a, a, a trunk that's just slightly past perpendicular, and we're just gonna exacerbate that. Number one or number two, number one, the formal approach, Number two, definitely a little bit, a little bit more pushed to that degree of forming that asymmetry. Which one do you like? Hit me with questions, Eve. Cool. All right. Uh, David wants to know with the sap flow, will it bleed right now? Definitely bleed. Okay. It'll definitely bleed. So when we're talking about this, we're making these cuts. I already see it starting to glisten a little bit. We're gonna want to act relatively quickly. Once we decide on the front, we're gonna decide on the angle. Once we decide on that angle, I'll be able to patch these pieces, then we'll bend, and then we'll come back and patch that bend once we're satisfied with what we get. All right, um, let's see, we got some numbers coming in. Bentley says two, Marty says one, Treebeard Steve says two, let's see, Kevin, Roger, and Kathy say one, Vern says two. So we're leaning towards one so far. 
By, so, so far. By the skin of our teeth. Barely, barely though. Let's hear. Bentley says one plus one equals two. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, Kevin Ferris says two. <laughs> Number two. I'm, I'm inclined to, to agree with Kevin. Number two? Yeah. Like a little bit more of the flow? I, I like the flow. I like the flow. Well, I feel like let's go ahead. Let's rigid. do this. Okay, we're going to set our sights on number two then. We're going to go ahead and set our sights on number two. And in setting our sights on number two, if we can't bend it far enough, then we'll go back to one right. and call it good. How's well, that? Well, now we got Rafi, Sarah, and Corey all saying one. Now we're leaning towards one. Andrew's ah. saying one. Oh, they're going back. Les says one. Wow. 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 Score's changing. Wow. Serious stuff. <laughs> okay, let's decide on the, uh, I, I love it. So basically what that means is, is, uh, is we're going to go with um, bending the trunk. Okay, so when we start to talk about this, we can't commit to a number, right? Right? <laughs> right? Okay. When we start to talk about this, we've got to talk about the plane in which we want to bend as well. This is of paramount importance, okay? So if we look from the side, Jesus, can you get that side angle here? Because this is really important. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, when we get this side angle, you see that this trunk sits back from the base, right? And where you're looking from the front here, right, that's, that's where the, the, the main camera is, but you see how far back this sits. So not only do we want to bend this this way, we want to come slightly towards the front so that the apex engages at least over the front or slightly in front of that piece of trunk right there, which means that our cut would have to be here to bend in that direction and get that apex off in that side, right? But also towards the front here. And that's a really important thing to, to understand. Now, I like the fact that I have right here two very willing open opportunities. I don't have any branches on the back side of this and I've got two really effortless pieces here that I can start to form that wedge cut in and I can actually use these scars as a manner to cut and use these scars in fact as a guidepost for my wedge to be able to bend in this direction. I'm gonna go ahead, since we're looking at this, we're talking about trying to make a maximum move, I'm gonna make sure that my blade is perpendicular. Trunk is here, blade is perpendicular here. I'm gonna start with that bottom cut, give myself just a little bit of grace, and I've gotta make sure that inside of this that I really do cut that wedge nice and clean, okay? Slightly angled up, so I'm not cutting straight into the trunk. I have a slight angle up. I know I've got to go 50% and I've got to continue to check my work, okay? Now, the direction of my saw, when I look at this saw blade here, perpendicular to this saw blade is where I need to pull to be able to close this piece. I like, when I start to look at this anchor point here, I really like this little area, this little junction in the root mass right in here, because it means I'm gonna be able to potentially block or brace that, that rebar. We know that rebar needs to be ideally uh, parallel to the line that that trunk is going to establish itself at to have that holding capacity. So our rebar is going to be coming in at a very, very uh, interesting angle to this root mass. And to make sure that this, this blade, when we start to look at this, has the ability for the trunk to pull in that direction. Perpendicular here is the angle of, of pull. That is how we're gonna line our rebar and we identify that space. This is all of the preparatory work to being able to do a really solid trunk bend and have success with it, okay? So if I rotate my blade, if I rotate my blade, What's happening is I'm changing that direction of where I'm gonna pull, okay? Right now, if I look perpendicular, my direction is headed over here. If I rotate my blade here, my direction is actually over in here. So just by a slight rotation, my rebar would have to switch from here to here. If I rotate back, I come back to here. That blade perpendicularness, we have this line here perpendicular to that line, is telling you everywhere about where that rebar needs to sit to give you the best and the most effective bend, okay? So be very, very careful when you start to perform this operation. Now, I'm looking at this, and I'm assuming that I have a very clear line to the 50% mark of my trunk. Again, you have to remove half. You've got to remove half of that tissue. Okay, either compression or, or tension. We know in a wedge cut on a pine, we remove compression. We're gonna be compressing the trunk, we're taking that wedge out, and therefore we're compressing, we've lost or removed 50% of that force. Need to make sure I'm 50% here, do not neglect. Do not assume, do not neglect 
the fact that when you come to the other side and you start looking at that line that you're bending on, there is a strong chance that you're gonna be shocked at how far through the other side. And I'm just trying to make sure, can I get there? Is there something in the way? There it is, there it is, okay? That already looks like it's 50%, oh my gosh! Did I cut too far? No, you didn't cut too far. Is that dangerous? A little bit dangerous. Do we need to keep going? On the other side, yes, on this side, no. That's what gives us the guidance of how far we need to go to get rid of that 50%. Okay, I'm, I'm bending in this line right now from this piece, that means my rebar is gonna be perfect. I love that, I wanna sit right inside this saddle. That This side is a little bit, I would say still a little bit undercut. Okay, I'm gonna go there, 50%, I feel good, I feel good. Now let's line up the next cut. I'm gonna line up the next cut and then I'm gonna open it up to questions so that you guys can wrap and we can see what we can get done. Okay, I'm looking. Now we're dealing with a circumference here. We're dealing with a round spherical surface, right? We have a radius there, boom, radius. Okay, so what that means is, this is gonna form this weird oblong football shape when we start to think about this in 2D. Weird oblong football shape. Wide up here, coming back to that corner of the mouth, right? A smile on a human face. Good example of what we're cutting here. We're cutting a smile into the trunk. It's gonna be happy when we're done, trust me, okay? So when we're thinking about that, the width here, and making sure we hit the corner here and the corner here of the smile, this is of utmost importance, okay? Now this is something that we execute by the way we put the saw in here and the way that this angle and this rotation all work out. This is a multi-planular, kind of multi-faceted decision. So I wanna be looking and trying to line up my corner. This angle here also matters in terms of that, uh, that, that ability to align our corners. And when we cut one this big, we've talked about it before, we've gotta be very, very careful, very, very careful. Okay, here we go. Let me just cut that just a little bit. I like you there. I like you there. Okay, I have a little bit of wiggle room, little bit of wiggle room as I approach this technique. Not much once I get this far in though. Like watching a surgery, it's making everybody nervous. Yeah, yeah, of course. For trunk, the trunk, trunk bending, <laughs> the first, the first one made. Oh, look at you! Look at you, handsome as all get out. Let's see if it moves. A little bit of movement. The benefit here. Roots are stable. I like it. I'm going to go a little bit farther in. The force is pretty strong still. The force in this one is strong. Okay, now you'll notice there's some wounds still right here. I'm planning on cutting all the way through those wounds. Don't worry about those, we're gonna get to that. Okay, nice, clean, really nice, clean. And you can see the thickness of the growth rings, right? This is that, that sort of master class. Go ahead and zoom in if you can, Jesus. This is that master class of, of field growing that Telperion was so incredibly talented at. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, maybe eight or nine years is what this tree is. That's it, that's it. It's a monster of a tree for eight or nine years, okay? All right, it looks to me like we have kind of the first setup. I'm gonna go ahead and set my rebar up. Now, I thought I was gonna utilize a little bit smaller rebar. It's very clear to me, much like the last trunk bending, that we're asking a lot and we're gonna demand a lot of force in return. So when I set this rebar, the longer the rebar, the better. Um, if it's obnoxiously long by the time we're done, that's okay. Now, by doing this, I obviously can't repot next year. And in doing this and not being able to repot next year, I will have the capacity to play on the momentum of the root system, put a lot of growth on the tree and potentially even uh, solidify this bend before I repot in 2022. So I'm okay with having this rebar be pretty deeply seeded in this root system, right? If I were going to try and repot or I, uh, I had a shallow container, we would have to think about a different system here. But I wanted to come back to trunk bending again because the last one was not successful and really kind of talk about how we give ourselves the best chance of success with an established root system as we stand now. Okay, so I'm gonna go in at an angle.
Okay, no problems there. Generally, when we talk about these field-grown trees, they have a lot of, lot of um, softness inside of the root mass because the roots go out to the edge and down, right? And especially in a grow bag, they kind of pollard themselves. The roots hit the wall of that bag. It has a little bit of a treatment of a chemical. That root dies and causes it to branch back behind it. But we get these kind of big stubs out here. The center is typically hollow. Okay, this may or may not work out for us when we talk about the logistics of doing a, a trunk bend on a tree like this, okay? When we start to apply this force, is the rebar inside the soil going to give with that soil or is the rebar in that soil gonna be rigid and locked in so that the rebar doesn't need to be buffered? If it starts to give, we already have the technique to offset that. We're gonna to have to block the rebar. And I've left this branch here as a little bit of a sacrifice so I can pull on that shoulder as a blocking point in case we need that added little bit of strength to be able to accomplish the act that we're going to perform, okay? So I'm gonna open it up to questions. I'm gonna get the, the, the bending point set up and we're gonna see if we can get this thing to bend, anchor it, and set and whether or not we've gotta go through all of the same processes as the last trunk bend to kind of modify as we move along. Go ahead, Eve. Awesome, all right, uh, let's see. Up first, we have Leonard, this is from a little bit earlier. Uh, with the large branches you just removed, would that area be good or bad for the wedge cut and why? Great, it's great for the wedge cut because we already removed them. The thing that we need to do is we need to get down to live tissue. Live tissue, live tissue connection. Now, the, the, the thing that people tend to assume is that these two regions are gonna heal. They're never gonna heal, right? This lip and this lip, they're never coming back together. That's not the way that a trunk bend works, okay? These will forever be separate pieces of tissue. Callus will form, callus will try to push that apart, right? Which is why we have to hold the bend for a 12 to 18 months, but it's never going to join or fuse back together. It just simply isn't in the cards. So if I have a little bit here that's gonna be getting sap flow, and if I have a little bit of those, those cut sites above it that's still gonna be getting sap flow, those will produce callus, those will heal. We won't have any dead spots where we're gonna see that lip, but those lips will never heal, and that's why we can use those wounds and not create yet another wound on the trunk that we have to heal those and heal a wedge cut. Okay, now because I utilized a lower point in terms of forming the wedge cut, what that means for me, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use this big gin or this big uh, cutoff piece up here. Now we talked about maybe we need to make a move on that. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say we're not gonna make the move now because we recognize we're gonna utilize it as a leverage device for our tree. If I thin that down, we understand that pines are incredibly soft. If I thin that down, the softness of that piece could potentially allow anything that we reduced as a gin to no longer uh, hold the trunk bin, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use it as it exists now. Okay, I'm gonna piece this. Now I'm using, I thought I was using 12, this is 10. That's a little too aggressive. It looks obnoxious, it feels obnoxious. Let's not do that, it felt a little heavy. The, the, the general tendency with the guy wire selection is to use a bigger, thicker wire, okay? And that's fine when you're using it to pull a clamp, that's fine when you're utilizing it uh, as a temporary piece you're gonna cut off. I have a feeling I'm gonna be able to get this trunk to move with my own force, and if I can get it to move with my own force, I'm only gonna need one wire, and the biggest, thickest wire I would ever use before I move to galvanized steel would be 12 gauge wire, and that's what this is, okay? 12 gauge, we wanna use the smallest gauge possible, looks better, looks cleaner, looks more proportional to the bend. I have yet to see 12 gauge uh, break in the operation of bending a trunk, but there are times where we have to double it up, and there are also times where we move to the galvanized steel. Um, Miss Mel says, won't those first three changes in direction all be very close in size if you cut there? Um, so we have, we have a relatively short, short, and then a long here. Definitely these first two, boom, boom. But you also have this, short, slightly longer, slightly longer, really long. There is a little bit of a sequential step up there that we're gonna have to think about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give it a little bit more juice. Everybody knows how this goes, right? Oh yeah, I yeah. mean, they're, they're all talking, they're, they go, this looks like a walk in the park after last year's uh, oh, trunk it bending. <laughs> Just turned into a two-parter and we were all biting our nails. 
as pieces went flying. Almost killed the cameraman. Killed the cameraman. <laughs> Safety goggles encouraged. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start really, really light, okay? Now, I, I stayed a little bit shallow in terms of I hit the 50% mark, but I'm going to start to cut past that 50% mark just a little bit, and as I continue to fold, I'm happy to go to the 60% mark. I don't want to go past the 60%, but what ends up happening is I just need a little bit more relief, a little bit more relief each time we do it, I don't want to go past that 60, and I'm really going to lean on this, and this is the advantage. <sighs> okay, now what I've got, because I went with such a big wedge cut, and I went past that, is I've got these little pieces that are just kind of touching each other right here and causing a little bit of an obstruction. So I want to be careful just to clean that out. It's going to be a slow, kind of monotonous process. I may get the jack, but just by leaning on it, I'm getting it to close. So I'm gonna watch this, and I'm gonna make sure that this rebar doesn't close anymore, or get any closer so that I know it's, it's kind of catching. And I'm just gonna lean, okay? Okay. Each time a little bit more, and we're gonna cut out the imperfection. You don't have to be perfect with your angles and your wedge cut, you just have to be perfect with how you cut it when you piece it back together. Everything on the back side so far so good, no issue, not worried about it. I'm wondering, let me go ahead and grab a jack real quick just to make sure that I don't have to overexert. Well, multiple types of jacks, you've seen this one before. Okay, this is gonna look hardcore on the tree this size. This is gonna look like I'm just abusing. This poor little thing. Okay, right around there. Right around there. All right, here we go. This will be a little bit more. Perfect. Okay. All right. Now we can be a little I can be a little bit more a little bit less deprived of oxygen and a little bit more explanatory here, okay? So every time I hit a stopping point, I'm just gonna come and I'm gonna clean that up. I'm gonna be aware of how far in I'm penetrating, okay? We got sap starting to accumulate in there. You would expect that. I'm seeing the rebar moving a little bit, okay? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move to the other side so that you can see this unobstructed, okay? All right, here we go. Now watch the rebar. Watch what happens in the tree. Okay, now the tree is moving. We hit that point. Tree is now moving. Gap is now closing. Back is looking good. Love it, okay? I'm gonna come back in, make sure that any of those areas, and just, just a light, just letting the saw blade not, not going crazy. Upper, upper edge of the bite, upper edge of my smile. Lips are touching a little bit. And pull that out nice and clean, okay? Now we come back. Let's go again. Okay, you see the wire moving. You see the trunk closing. You get to see that beautiful kind of change of position. Happening, backside, looks spectacular. Still good, okay? Ooh, now we're starting to get some beautiful contact. Upper side is closing faster, probably because we're pulling at that angle. That top side has probably got a little bit because the gin is off to this side. A Little bit of a rotation in that close. We will, we will shore that up as we start to get this closer and closer to finality. Okay, I'm gonna come back in here, that sap really starting to flow, healthy tree, very active at this time of year. Okay, let's keep going. Right, now every once in a while, I like to come back here in case the jack slips, in case something becomes a little bit compromised, 
I like to come back and I like to close this piece just so that I have a stop gap. Should, the, should something happen, suddenly the jack, boom, pops off the rebar. I don't want the tree to go flying. I don't want there to be a lot of force. This wire acts as a stop gap, okay? Here we go. Yes, beautiful movement now. Beautiful movement. Now I've gotta be careful, right? Because I could technically keep turning the jack. I could keep pulling that tree and I could continue kind of getting this, but I'm creating, if I have uh, contact in any one of these regions, I start to create a lot of location where if I'm hitting here, the force is being focused on the backside there. So if I don't keep cutting to take out those areas of contact right there, so that I clear that up and I continue to move here, I can pop out that backside and blow up that bend, right? So I just wanna to continue to be very, very systematic about the cutting of this and execution of this. And we're really starting to get a lot of contact on that upper area, which is great because our, our, our alignment of our cut is really starting to happen now. <laughs> takes a little bit more effort, takes a little bit more time, but we're starting to get a really nice bend. And you can see that, oh, that compression. Okay, let's keep going. Here we go. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, everything good? Everything looks good. Looks good, feels good. Talk real purdy. Looks nice, okay. This is gonna progressively become more work. And if I over tighten this, when I come back into cut here, it becomes a huge problem as well because it just has so much pressure. Now, one of the things about this operation that a lot of people don't really understand is that this is very, very fundamental in the bending process for pines. This isn't some abnormal, like bonsai master technique or anything like that. Getting it to line up cleanly, getting everything to work together in the manner that it should, that, that, that is complex. Getting it to close cleanly, rotate cleanly, all of that stuff I think is complex. But getting the, getting the actual tree to bend, that's quite effortless. That is not the skill, right? It's, it's the angles, it's the knowledge of the saw, it's the depth, it's the utilization of the rebar. That's, that's really where sorry, that advanced knowledge comes from. Okay, but as I'm doing this, because I don't have a dead straight pull to the rebar, what's happening with the, these mouths of the bend is that I'm getting just an ever so slight rotation this way, right? And what's happening is this is closing and it's just rotating, just like that, okay? And so I'm getting consequently a little bit of a kick out, kind of like a fish hook, you know? Yep, yep. Can you see this right there, Lonnie? Can you see that, Jesus? Yep. Yeah? Which one looks better? Yeah, there we go. Okay, see this little kick out? A little fish hook right there on the cheek. Just a little kick out of tissue. Now, all of this back here, beautiful. No tears, no stretching, no elongation. This is amazing, okay? Because we took out a majority of the compressive force. What I wanna do is tighten my wire, I'm gonna loosen the jack, and I'm gonna change the position of the jack so that that overbite that's happening, I just change that, right? I bring it right back to where it needs to be. This is the, the best use of the jack to do this slowly and observe these things, okay? While I'm changing this, ask me some questions. All right, awesome. Uh, let's see, up next we've got Bill. Bill says, at what thickness of branch or trunk do you make the decision to wedge cut over bend? Um, I would say if you try to apply physical force and there is a minimal amount of mobility, you're already recognizing the shape of the bend is gonna be quite round and quite unattractive. 
And when we start to say, I want a tighter, sharper bend, and I'm never gonna be able to get there because even with just a, a minimal amount of force, it takes a lot to get this to move. That is my introduction to the wedge cut, right? So if you take a branch and you start bending it and you have total control, I'm gonna say, good, twist and, twist and bend gets me a tight bend, right? But if I start bending it and I'm like bending out here to get that flex, I'm saying if I want this area to bend, I got a wedge, right? And that's really where I draw the line because we can get so wedge happy that we start wedging things that don't need the wedge and that's really when we start causing problems. This is a very, I would say, not risky, but I would say this is a very, um, this is a very uh, intentional operation that demands that we understand what it takes to be able to execute it well. And that means that we don't want to apply it and it tends to fail very easily on too thin of material. Okay, now I have three stubs up here at the top. I said I wanted to be very careful and maintain one living branch on that backside. I'm gonna cut out that third stub and I'm actually gonna use that third stub as the handlebar here to correct that overbite really quickly and see if we can get that alignment back in play. And what that means is I'm also gonna have to use another piece of wire. I can go with a smaller wire because now I've really taken out the force with the 12. I'm gonna come back to a 14 and I'm gonna use a piece of guy wire with 14 that allows me to hold that corrective overbite and rotation that I'm going to be fixing. I'm still gonna use the jack to do it, makes it very effortless. We can all watch the correction process occur. But the fact that we're playing now on pulling on one side, pulling on another side, pulling on one side, pulling on another side is one of those adaptive components that we tend to engage with when we start the trunk bending process. And this is just one of those nuances. We understand it, we technically are, have the capacity to fix it, and it helps us, okay? Now I'm gonna come over the top of this so that I'm not coming under the bottom of this. This is gonna be a branch that drops down in the front. What that means is I need to protect that shoulder, and this is a lot of force that's gonna come across this shoulder. I'm gonna put a fairly substantial piece of rubber right there and just use the very base of that branch Against that, now we've got a really good solid piece. And I want to go just below. I never want to come above the prior guy wire. I want to go just below. You can't see anymore? You want me to boost it up? Let's see. Ah, here. Here. There you go. There you go. Take a look at that. Take a look at that. Right, see that rubber underneath there, the branch coming over the top of this, this is coming down. I see this as my apex up here, right? So this piece right here is gonna be my apical region. This piece is gonna drop down in front and I've come up over the top of that so that I can drop that down, okay? All right, let's see what we can do here. <sighs> tell you what, I tell you what, anybody who says bone size easy hasn't watched Mirai live. <laughs> just kidding. I don't know how many people are out there saying bone size easy. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I saw it on YouTube. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, that looks like that's going to slip. Let me change this just a little bit. Okay, now we're in. All right, let's start that cutting process again. Now I'm pulling again from a different location. I should get that rotation. So let me come back to here. Okay, and I'll drop it back down, Lonnie, after I'm done. Oh, we're starting to get some really, really beautiful contact in here. Some superb contact in here. Mm. See where we are on this backside? Love it. Got a lot of fine sawdust. Let's go ahead and get that cleared out so that we have the ability to continue diving deep. Okay. All right, we're going to keep going. Let me go ahead and hop over here again. 
just so that we can watch it. Let me go a little bit more here. Okay, there we go. Okay, ready? There we go. Oh, that's nice. That's closing really nice now. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. It's brought that whole thing down. Everything super flush, super duper flush, clean, nice. That's gonna give us a really nice close, really nice healing process. Backside isn't even stretching yet. Everything going swimmingly well compared to the last time. Let's go ahead and give it one more cut. Now, I wanna just, I'm gonna tilt this up for a moment so that Jesus can show you what this lip looks like. Okay, and you can see there's still a little bit of a gap right here. Let me go a little bit more, there you go. Okay, still just a little bit of a gap. Now you see the 50% mark, again, 50%, maybe 60%, there's a lot of tissue on this backside but I have just a little bit of a space right there. I'm not worried about this, this will heal. Not concerned about that at all, but I wanna close that space. So we've gotta keep going from this perspective, okay? Let me come on back here. Right when we get into that point where those two areas are really nice, oh, look how clean that's getting now. All the sap, soaked wood, all of that cleaned out and we start to get into just this really nice, now we're starting to hit that point where the core, okay? When this starts to get really nice and clean, what's happening here is now the edges are merging, right? So what just happened is we started here, let me get out of here, there we go. We started here and we bent here and we bent here and we bent here, okay? And we started talking about this popping out. So we kept cutting and cutting and cutting and now we're to a point where that looks like this, okay? There's hollowness on the inside there. And now it's just the lip. So now we won't have to cut nearly as much and we just want to cut and cut and cut and have that nice clean close. That's what we're working on now. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, this is gonna be a monster tree. Okay, here we go. Okay, nice and cut or closed. Let me grab the pliers really quickly. I'm gonna close both sides. Because both sides have that tension on them to keep that really nice and square to the rebar. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna close both sides. Is the 12 gauge gonna hold more than the 14? Not necessarily, and I'm gonna show you how to, again, extend this wire. Let's go ahead and do one. Man, that's pretty nice, pretty nice already. Backside just, just, just opened up. Just opened up. Jesus, go ahead and focus right there. Just opened up, and opened up in a really interesting way. Opened up showing that torsion that's occurring here. You see that linear crack, let me rotate, stay there. Stay there, stay there. Yes, there you go. See that linear crack right there? Boom, okay? That means we're done. That's where we stop, okay? The, the, the mouth of the cuts, very, very close to being closed. That opening up says, hey, you're pushing me really far, okay? So let's call it right there. Now, when we look at this, and when we look at how far this is bent, this is insane. Insane, because you're talking about a trunk that has that kind of girth. This is a relatively big trunk. When I, when I wrap that, yeah, you're right there. Yeah, that's, that's big. How many, would you say? Two, three inches? Three inch trunk? Yeah, three, three? Okay, and we just took it, and we took it from back here all the way over the top. Now we can pursue number one or number two. Let me go ahead and let me elongate the wire really quickly, okay? I'm gonna show you what this looks like. Okay, now, the, the, the copper wire that's holding this right here is under tension, but there's no way that I can tighten that copper wire to a degree that it actually holds. So I've gotta undo the clamp, put the tension on the wire, which is gonna open the mouth, and then I've gotta close the mouth again and tighten the wire to take over the force of the clamp. So watch this, I'm gonna count. One, oh, one turn. Is that it? I guess it helped. You're done. I don't even have to worry about it. Boom, <laughs> got it. 
Got it. That was anticlimactic, but also <laughs> kind of a huge relief. Okay, clamp is out. Yes, yes. And now let's go ahead and paste and patch, okay? Really, really nice. While I'm doing this, Eve, I'll open it up to questions, and then we'll go about the styling process and see how we handle the change of the position of the trunk. Awesome. Uh, so Leonard wants to know, won't the cell structure of those two cut branches hinder new flow? Um, no, not in a pine. Pine move resources laterally as well as vertically. And when you start to talk about that, because you've got those two cut branches, number one, we cut off all of the, the scar tissue or the, the shoulder from the bottom one. The top one just has a slight, um, the top one just has a very slight, I'm no longer licking my finger while I do this, so I just, <laughs> I just had to spit on something yeah, it was real very, quick. You look so suspicious, like you were like, well, nobody I looked watched. At the I looked at the camera, I'm like, is everybody really gonna watch me spit on the, the nursery can of it's, the tree? But It happened and now I'm drawing attention to it, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, but here's the thing about pines, they will continue to allocate resources towards damaged areas of the tree for several years, so this cut site that's right at, the, at the, the mouth of that bend is gonna continue to produce callus and heal with the vascular tissue. Even though it's above the cut site, this is why we can cut through 50% or 60% of this tree and still plan on the branches above it, i.e. this branch directly above it, still having a tremendous amount of success because resources are gonna come around through the living, they're gonna come over here laterally and they're gonna come up to that branch that's conducting those resources. All right, um, let's see. Kevin Ferris wants to know, uh, what is the general success rate of trunk wedge cuts? Um, the first trunk wedge cut I ever lost was the one we did on the live stream, and it's still the only one. So for me, it's uh, considering that we've done it on hundreds of trees, literally hundreds of trees, uh, it's, it's 99 point, 99 point whatever, 2%. Everybody right? get your calculators out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, this, this technique, it, 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 it seems so spectacular and it seems so far out uh, side of the realm of fundamental bonsai. But in all actuality, to pull out the saw and do a trunk bend in the Mirai workshop is, uh, we styled, I don't know, let's see, we styled six trees this weekend and five of them had wedge cuts taken out of the trunk or of the major branches in the tree. Very common. Very common, very effective. Uh, limber pine, ponderosa pine, black pine. Uh, we're now doing it on a Japanese white pine. All of them respond very well to this operation, okay? Uh, this tear in the back, the split in the back, this is where I go back to liquid. I like to get, in terms of the liquid, I like to get the, the um, gooey, kind of endoacetic acid laden um, liquid into that cut site so that it, it starts to immediately stimulate the cellular division and starts to immediately stimulate tissue production there. Okay, it's already the fall season. Beautiful time, if you're gonna push this tree in the way that we've pushed it, beautiful time to be pushing it because productiv productivity vascularly happening at a rapid, rapid pace right now, okay? Uh, let's see, uh, Kevin wants to know, did Kimura utilize this approach quite a lot? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, so here's the thing, and here's, here's what has to be understood about, um, about bonsai in, in, say, Europe and North America, is we are dealing with such a higher quantity, not a higher quality, but a higher quantity of raw material at this point in time in our bonsai culture that we're doing things that were very common for Japan a long time ago, or we're using them in different ways, changing, expanding, and evolving those techniques. Mr. Kimura used this technique a lot, but he also dealt with a lot of pines that didn't necessarily need this technique because they had already been trained and had already been worked to a degree where this wasn't necessarily applicable, okay? I'm gonna keep answering your questions. I'm gonna come back and I'm actually gonna set the structure tonight, right? Let's go ahead and take this to a degree where we can set this out, have photosynthetic efficiency, and allow the tree to really capture as much sun, sustainable design. We need foliar mass on the tree, but it doesn't mean we can't go about the normal working process, okay? Just because we did a wedge cut to think that now we have to keep our hands off, it's not the same as repotting, right? This is a very calculated event. If it goes successfully, we continue with the work on the tree and nothing should change over the course of this fall as a result of the operation we've made. 
And in, in that same vein, as we kind of look at how all of the structure on this tree is working, as we would expect, but a little bit unique to a white pine, and this is really where we start to talk about Pinus parviflora, independent of the field-grown notion, is we do get these big, long branches with very minimal numbers of buds or small, fine ramification on the interior here. That's okay. We're gonna feed this aggressively. We're gonna build up a tremendous amount of needle mass. And while this tree is still incredibly young, we're gonna get that back budding to occur. But we have a limited number. We have a limited number of years. This is not a multi-flush pine. This is not a pine that we decandle. This is not a pine that back buds profusely. We have a limited number of years on a white pine, on a ponderosa pine, on a limber pine, to be able to take advantage of the young tissue here that still has the ability to create buds. This trunk is nine years old. That means this branch is probably three years old. I probably have another 12 to 18 months to get it to back bud right here before I will no longer be able to generate those buds. So if I lay this out, I take all that oxen, again, laying the structure out, oxen in the vertical form, cytokinin, cytokinin, back budding, needle mass at the tip, that's where we get the production of that vascular tissue over this fall season, expansion of foliar mass next spring, and we start to see those back buds forming on that interior tissue. This work after that bend has to happen if we want that back budding to occur. One of the biggest mistakes of Japanese white pine that are young, that are field grown, that are nursery stock grown, is that they're not set and they don't get those, people don't work to get those buds on the interior to set themselves up for a future tree. When that tree still has that capacity, bark starts to form, cork cambium starts to form. Even if it's not rugged bark, even if it's smooth bark, that impedes and impairs the ability for back budding to form. This move right now, very specific to Japanese white pine, lay it out, fertilize the daylights out of it, carry on the momentum of the root system, and get the buds on that interior wood in the next 12 to 18 months. You set yourself up for the future of that tree, okay? This is a big one right here, okay? So I'm gonna take out all structural flaws, I'm gonna work within the design process. We'll talk about, do we pull in, do we push out? Do we go this way, do we go this way? Let me just get rid of the stuff I absolutely can't use, okay? And, and just to quantify that, Lonnie, focus on this area right here, okay? So we have these areas right here. In any well-grown pine, doesn't matter who grew it, you are going to have a propensity for bar branching, branches that occur on opposing sides of the trunk immediately across from each other. And we recognize the trunk counts as a line in the design. Right? So if we have three lines here, we're gonna be uh, elongating and thickening in this direction, in this direction, and in that direction. And that's where we get this trunk suddenly, boom, inverse taper right here. And we have another junction immediately above it, okay? So I need to be thinning this down. Now we just said we need this needle mass to both heal this and we need this needle mass to drive interior budding. So I don't wanna take this down to the branches that I want in five years, in 10 years, right? I wanna leave more branches than I need, but the branches that I leave cannot expand on or exacerbate a structural flaw. We're already starting to get swelling, I need to be very selective. And that's where I really like the notion of saying, hey, if I go ahead and I look at this branch, I look at this branch, I look at this branch, and I look at this branch, I've got branches that are of a higher quality and I have branches of a lower quality. Notice that this is a stub, it's stumped, I've got some thin spindly pieces here and an intermediate piece here. Contrast that to this piece. Again, stumped, but my transition of taper, a little bit more established and quite a bit better. However, the, the crotch is acute, or excuse me, obtuse. That's a tough crotch to deal with. Now I come to here, great size, better lateral orientation if I wanna drop it down, great transition of taper, and my branching is acute. This is superior to this, this is superior to this. So when I look at the grand scheme of things, this is the worst branch of these three and actually the worst branch of these four. However, if I just go ahead and I say, boom, I take that out. I haven't thought at all about do I need this branch right here or not. If I take this out, I'm probably looking at also taking this big long piece out here, right? And so now all of a sudden I have these two branches stacked on top of each other. That's not good, is it? No, it's not good. I've got this lower piece here. This is kind of obstructing that. I wanna take this one out. If I take this one out, now all of a sudden I've got a problem because this is the crappiest one and these two are still stacked. I wanna try and find and buy myself that space inside of this structure. 
my assumption is the best two branches to keep are gonna be here and here. Even though this is a poor branch, I'm gonna contrast a poor branch with a really good branch. I'm gonna take these pieces out to get rid of all of that growth in the middle, and I'm gonna make room for this big piece right here. Let me go ahead and look from the front and just verify that's what I wanna do. Ooh, I like that. That's going to be quite nice. That's the move I'm going to make. Here we go, let's go ahead. I'm gonna take this out, bam. I'm gonna take this out, bam, okay? I'm gonna paste those, make them nice. I'm not even gonna worry about necessarily cleaning that to a significant degree, because we know as this thickens, we're gonna probably have to come back in and do a little bit more work on those. I'm totally comfortable with that. I don't wanna get it too deep while I've got this damage down below. Just a nice removal and call it good, okay? But that helped with the decision-making process establish, even though I have the worst structured branch still present on the tree, it was the best option to have the most foliage in this region and not continue to cause structural flaws, and I did keep the best branch, right? I kept the best branch. That's the important piece. That's the only piece that'll be here in the finished tree. All right. Um, we've got a couple of people asking about like species that you could do a trunk mend on. So um, let's see, can this technique be used on taxis? Thuya, uh, Atlas Cedar, Radiata Pine. Mm -hmm. uh, and what trees can you specifically not do a trunk bending on? Yeah, so there's all, all kinds of questions, right? Whenever we do a trunk bend, the natural progression of questions is, ooh, can I do this on an elongating species? Can I do this on, you know, can I do this on uh, a, a, a deciduous tree? Can I do this on, um, you know, any, any number of things? The only thing that I am absolutely 100 positively sure about in terms of a really significant trunk bend is that you can absolutely do it on pinus, pinus in terms of pines as a, as a species where you can dependably have success. They can dependably move resources laterally as well as vertically. And that is really where kind of my uh, definitive confidence and knowledge stops, right? Can you do it on another uh, species? Can you do it on elongating species? Have I ever tried it on a dug fir? Have I tried it on a thuya? Have I tried it? I've tried it on a lot of them. And what I've found is that it didn't necessarily go bad, but it didn't necessarily dependably go good. Uh, Kevin Ferris asked, How, what's your percentage of success? I said, I've only lost one. And that's really, really honest. I've only ever lost one tree, the tree that we did on the stream to this, okay? So that is to say, I've had a tremendous amount of success in terms of trunk bending, right? So having that kind of success, I feel very confident that pine specifically is a very capable species to accept this kind of work. I have done it on dug fir, I've done it on some thuya, um, and I've had a 50-50 success rate. Was it a failure of operation? Uh, potentially, right? Was it a, a misapplied technique? Potentially. Is there a different timing or a, a, a nuance? Maybe. I don't know, and that's where I would say I can't confidently give you the answer that you can do this on any species, anytime, anywhere. All right. Uh, Chuck Wheat says that they thought the, that steel was preferred in terms of a guy wire. Why are we using copper this time? Um, copper is easier to tie underneath the jack, honestly. It's just easier to work with, period. Steel preferred for sure uh, because of its strength. It's just a little bit harder to work with. And if I'm just being totally uh, upfront with you, I wired for like, I, I, the amount of work I did yesterday on trees and over the weekend, my hands are pretty sore. Copper was the luxury tonight. Yeah, a little bit, little bit of an indulgence. All right, um, let's see. Uh... Freebeard Steve says, if the lips won't fuse, what will keep the cut from being evident in indefinitely? Um, the lips were super close, but here's what you got to think about. The callus is coming. The callus is coming. The callus is coming, right? Was that the red coats? Is that what that was? Yeah. That, yeah, yeah the yeah, red yeah, coats yeah, are yeah, coming? Yeah, yeah. The candle in the, in the, the window? The, the British are coming. Um, yeah. No, they were the red, weren't they the red coats? Yeah, I mean, they're the red coats, but I think they said the British are coming. Oh, did they say the British are I mean, coming? I don't know. I wasn't, did? I wasn't I, around when that happened, so I'm not yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, right. Well, who we was really it? Paul know. Revere. There he was. Yes. There he mm -hmm. was, Paul Revere. You see, I, w I listen to history. <laughs> I'm, there's, it's probably debatable at this point whether it was at actually this point, Paul yeah. Revere, right? <laughs> who knows? I, I, I do know it's pizza night. Yeah, I am. I'm working hard. It's I'm working hard. <laughs> you let me focus, we'll go get pizza. Big pizza. Okay, you Big got it. Big pizza night. Uh-huh. Callus is coming, right? So the tighter that we get it, 
And the more that we hold that together, the less that callus is gonna push that apart and the less that callus is gonna act up on us, right? If there's a little bit of space, we're gonna see a little bit more callus, but bark is gonna take care of that over the course of time, especially when this does start to bark up. We will, and it's already barking up in the lower portion of this trunk. This is gonna happen very rapidly. As we start to give it a little bit more time and attention, this bark is gonna move up this trunk in two to three years, and we'll be able to cosmetically remove that incision right there. In fact, it's far more desirable to have this incision done on a very smooth amount of tissue without bark than having bark, because you end up cutting through the bark and having uh, a forever scar there unless you cosmetically glue bark to it, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna crank on some of these branches. I'm gonna use four gauge to see if I can get uh, some movement in them. And I just want to focus. When we start to focus on the actual shoulder and the design of a tree that we've ju just done this kind of work on, we really want that shoulder to have that downward movement, okay? So I'm gonna try uh, and, and really lean in on this. Now I've got to be careful because up here at the top I've got that leverage device and I've already bent 50% of the tissue. Down low here where I don't have that leverage I can still apply a lot of bodily force to this to get that movement and know that I'm not going to have the kind of leverage that's going to impact the bend that I've just made. Okay, Four gauge on a tree this small. Kind of tough. Okay. All right, let's see what happens here. <clears throat> Just to follow up on that previous question, so will the new callus tissue fuse? No, no, okay. no, no, it won't fuse, which makes it ultra frustrating, okay? What okay. size is the wire you're working with right four, now? Four gauge. Four gauge. Four gauge. Four gauge, and I've got to hit this top branch, even though it's not the thickest, because this touch point right here gives me that length of leverage. Ugh. There it is. Okay, now that goes there. Go ahead and take that piece down to there. Okay, that's gonna be a really beautiful defining branch. I like that, that feels good. This backside here, this feels a little bit nastier. This feels a little bit nastier and I'm gonna show you something here that you're not gonna see many people show you and that is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna wrap this four gauge up and over this little stub right here. Okay, and there's a reason for this. I need that leverage of that stub, okay? If I can't grab the farthest, the farthest extent of this, right, then I have no holding capacity because the holding capacity on my four gauge would be right here. But now by grabbing this, I, I get almost another inch and watch what happens here. That extra inch allows me to bend that super rigid branch down just enough to get those branches to a point where they start to play laterally in the negative space that exists inside of that tree, okay? Last piece is up here in terms of structure. I've already done all of the cutting down here, and I'm gonna go ahead, what time is it, Eve? Uh, it is 7.10. Yeah, perfect. I'm gonna wire this out so that we have some time to converse and we can see what a finished kind of raw Japanese white pine would look like. Um, let me get this last piece of four gauge on and then we'll, we'll kind of crush on some commentary. Okay, now when I'm thinking about this, again, I'm coming back to four gauge, really short, really short, stout pieces. A tree this size and everybody's like four gauge, goodness gracious, yes. And the four gauge, tight turns on a four gauge. Not tight because I have to have tight, tight because I have to hit certain points to have my wire over the farthest pieces of leverage, right? So what that means here, Jesus, go ahead and zoom into that right there, okay? I have to have my four gauge come up and over this piece right here to gain that leverage. Otherwise, this turn will not give me control of the drop of the branch. I really have to get up and over the top of that, okay? So that's, I know I've gotta hit that. That's where the function exists. I'm gonna go ahead and just set myself up. I'll come back and tighten it, okay? But you see how I climbed up over that? That gives me the length, right? Now I have a lever arm that is that long, right? From my thumb here to there versus a lever arm that's that long, right? That turn right there, that's my grip. That's my effective wire point where that piece is gonna be 
pulling that branch down, okay? So I'm gonna come around the apex here. Apex is coming towards the front. We haven't talked about where it's going. I obviously have notions of where it's gonna go, but you're gonna help me make that decision as we start to get this a little bit further down the track. Ugh. Go ahead, Eve. Ready, all right, here we go. Uh, Zoda and Brady, you wanna know who made the clamp? What was the brand and source on that? Um, clamp is, um, clamp is uh, Kikua, Kikua. Wow. Yeah, but I think there are I think there are um, manufactured clamps in either North America. I know there's a few uh, machinists that have made some some versions of clamps um, over the course of time. And let me just show you the clamp really quickly because there's a few really important things here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So most important thing about a really good clamp is uh, the tightness of this thread. And you want that thread to be incredibly tight because it allows you the slowest amount of movement, right? And that's a pain in the butt when you're trying to quickly lower the clamp, but it's really, really valuable when you're just getting an incremental increase as that clamp pushes forward, right? So it's a very, very small, tight thread on the clamp, okay? Now, you also wanna make sure that that, that piece, that clamp, uh, has a, a, a dead head that's pushing against this bottom hook. So this is a hollow hook right here. And that, that rod is pushing against the physical uh, piece here. There are other clamps that push on the backside and it causes a leverage of this, of this hook right here. So if you're always pushing up on this piece from the front, this socket will never bind on this, uh, on this uh, shaft that it's sliding on, okay? And then the top piece right here, obviously this weld is one of the most important welds that exists in bonsai, just in terms of giving a lot of rigidity because if that piece breaks off, there's so much danger with the force that you're gonna put on this clamp that you really can have a lot of problems. And the last part of this, sometimes this thread rod gets bent and once it gets bent, your jack is done. Uh, because as you're turning, that rod is bent, it starts to auger out this location down here that holds the thread and really dictates how forceful that thread can be. It gets off kilter, it's very difficult to undo. And we have had moments at Mr. Kimura's where we got the jack frozen inside of a tree under such a tremendous amount of force that we had to go get a physical metal cutting uh, blade on the uh, four inch grinder and cut it off. And the whole thing, it was very dangerous. It exploded, it was super gnarly. Um, that's how much force you can put on these things. Now this is a low force jack. This can probably handle, I'm guessing three, uh, 400 pounds per square inch. Um, when you start to talk about the double bar jack, the, the, the um, sort of compressive jack from Masakuni, that can hold a car. You could lift a, a, an eight ton car with that jack. Small, small jack, right? You could lift an eight ton car with it. Uh, that is even more complex to build and also more complex to use. At some point, we will, we will tap into that jack and the use of that jack. Right, uh, let's see, Rafi wants to know, when you're using the saw to shave off a bit of the access from the top to close cleanly, how do you know that you're not shaving off from the bottom too, which would just keep widening the gap? Um, well, so you've got your two surfaces here. You've got your two surfaces, Rafi, okay? And you're just cutting right down the middle of those surfaces. So you, your saw at that point, and this is a big advantage of using a little bit of a coarser sawtooth, right? Like, when you talk about this, this as far as a bone size saw is not a fine saw. This is a, a, and it's not a super coarse saw. Now don't get me wrong, it's not like this has big monster teeth. This is a, a medium saw at best. Now if you were using a saw, let me see here, I've got, there it is. Okay, this is a super fine saw, okay? That's a fine saw right there. Jesus is gonna show that to you. Let me, let me there we go. Okay, this is a really fine saw. This is for ultimate refinement work, deciduous, and you can see that it's got a several more teeth inside of those blades. Can you zoom in on that, Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the coarseness of the one on the left versus the fineness of the one on the right. The one on the right can do what you're talking about, Rafi. It can cut into the top or it can cut into the bottom because it has so many more teeth, right? So when I'm doing this kind of trunk bending operation, you would naturally think I want the finest possible tooth. 
That's not correct. You want an intermediate tooth. This is the saw for, for doing big wedge cuts. This kind of a fine saw, this is for really, really refined levels of pruning, and this will cause massive problems if you unit, use it in the wedge cutting process. Because all of a sudden, when you're trying to close this, you're cutting into the top here, you're cutting into the bottom, you're making new incisions entirely. It's not so uh, moderate that it just goes right through the open space in the path of least resistance. It'll start to enter new sections of wood. All right, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know anything about how this might, how wedge cuts might work with spruce, uh, specifically Colorado blue spruce? Um, there are there are a lot of um, there are a lot of people that have attempted, and the only person that I've seen consistently utilize wedge cuts is Michael Hagedorn on spruce. Uh, I'll never forget 2010 Santa Clara. He was uh, using a saw to make the angle of the wedge cut um, significantly more uh, acute in its angle of drop to show that alpineness. And, um, and I had never seen that before. I was really, really shocked by that. Uh, I think he continues to use it. I think there are other people that use it. Feels very uncomfortable to me. But I am also indoctrinated uh, about spruce by a bonsai professional. Uh, in Mr. Kimura, who lived outside of the zone of where spruce could be really cavalier. You could be really cavalier with spruce. You had to be very careful in Tokyo because it was too hot for the Ezo spruce. And the Ezo spruce is historically a very, very weak spruce um, to begin with. So can you on a Colorado blue spruce? I would imagine there's some degree of wedge cut that you could do. Can you do a trunk wedge? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, and I'm going to pull this forward and just leaning into it, but also supporting. Okay, and that gives me that forward lean. Now, we have not in any way, shape, or form started to talk about is the apex coming this way or is the apex going back this way, right? We have, okay, and I did go ahead and I went ahead and rotated it kind of as we talked about. You can see we could go a little bit more to go back to that greater amount of flow right here, which feels nice, right? You get this move up here and then you get this move here. Okay, that feels really, really nice. The more formal upright setting of that is gonna be right there. That's kind of where we started the process, but it does center the apex a little bit more, right? And when we start to talk about this now, does this become the defining branch or does that piece become the defining branch? I don't like that piece being the defining branch. It's this low little hip. It kind of has a little nub and then some small little pieces coming out here. This feels way grander, feels way more positioned to generate kind of distance, to generate flow, to generate asymmetry. However, if we're trying to compress, if we're trying to shrink this tree down, then compressing on this side and pushing in and keeping this nice and tight here and really shrinking down this tree to be this little powerhouse, that way, having it return on itself and show that tension would be the way that you would get that to occur. Give me your thoughts. Do we go harmony? Do we rotate it more to get flow and push this out here? Or do we push back to the right in tension and do we compress that and create a really short, powerful, traditional, very close to symmetrical, slightly asymmetrical, but more of that traditional form? Let me know what you think as we answer a few more questions. Right, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna drop this down, so we might have to change the main camera just a bit. Right, um, Rafi says, there are two models of jacks like the one that you're using, one with concave jaws like this and another with convex. One is for pushing and one is for pulling. Do you feel the other is necessary or just the concave like you have is enough even for pulling apart operation using the wire instead of contacting the branch with wire? Um, the pulling apart jack I've used like, uh, cause I have one. I have one that actually flips around, right? Where you can take it and you can flip it and you can, and you can push, push things apart instead of pulling them together. Um, I've used that uh, twice in my bonsai career, like tw twice ever. Actually one was this weekend and I'm gonna tell you it was really nice to have it. Um, I think it's far less functional than the one that pulls things together. And so I would say if you were going to try and purchase something that gave you the best bang for your buck, you're gonna get the jack that, that uh, compresses things as opposed to the jack that uh, spreads things. Right, it's looking like from the chat so far, people are saying to go towards the traditional and that little squatty and They and want that squattiness, image. don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah Kevin, the, the little Bentley power. and Kim are all on that side. Same a with little, Wesley. A little strong. Now here's, here's the interesting thing. This is a Japanese white pine. 
And inside of that, the Japanese white pine very much abides by that traditional notion of design. To some degree, we talk about the born-in implications of the species, the influence of the aesthetic that that species is most commonly cultivated in. And I definitely respect the fact that people are saying, hey, let's push it towards that more traditional, really tight, short, powerful, medium-sized Japanese white pine. I love that idea. I'm totally okay with that, right? It doesn't always have to be the dramatic degree of asymmetry that we seek in bonsai design. We get a lot of that. I'm very interested. Now, consequently, as I'm putting the movement into this branch, instead of carrying this out, I'm going to be pushing this in, okay? This is where this goes. And notice how I'm laterally spreading these. These come out, they have an acuteness, and then they spread into their own foyer masses. Very much valuing these tiny buds on the interior, but I cannot reduce this quite yet. I'm gonna start that process. I'm going to start that process. I want to make sure I have enough foyer mass to drive the back budding. I wanna make sure I have enough foyer mass to move the water out of the nursery can. We have removed quite a bit of foyer mass already for the size of the tree. I'm going to be driving that process, okay? And when I start this process, oftentimes a lot of people will wire to here and then say, well, I only want these, so I'm gonna stop there, no. We have to create photosynthetic efficiency. The tip of this branch does need to be angled upwards so that we have that presentation. And when you talk Japanese white pine, you are talking lower water mobility, long needle single flush pine. So we really do have to get this into a position much uh, different than the Japanese black pine. High water mobility reorientation of the growth will happen very fast. When we're talking a slower growing species like a Japanese white pine, when we start to talk about mugos, when we start to talk about some of these varieties that do have a little bit of a slower growth habit, a little bit of a lesser degree of water mobility, mugo being moderate, but Japanese white pine, ponderosa pine, um, some of these uh, limbers, etc., we need to be orienting that tip up because it doesn't reorient with the low water mobility very rapidly, okay? That's how we get the strength and health in this lower branch. We are obviously aspiring to use these interior pieces. These are the very best pieces for what the tree can become. Let's see, uh, Joe J wants to know, after a wedge cut heals, is the area of the tree less stable or does it heal strong? I know that bark will not heal, but will the trunk need to be stabilized? No, it will actually, um, obviously in this initial move, it's a little bit sensitive and it's a little bit tenuous, okay? But when it heals, when it's actually quote unquote healed, when it's produced a significant amount of, of resource on the back, when this backside is thickened, it will be just as rigid, if not more so, than the rest of the trunk. Typically, when we do a wedge cut like this, that is not the weakest point of the trunk moving forward, which is very interesting because you would assume it is. All of this resource has to flow through 40 to 50% of the tissue. This tissue that's left starts thickening and starts getting so strong that it will actually protrude a little bit more and create a greater amount of movement through this piece by buttressing on this backside and forming a sharper movement. That's one of the secrets to really pushing a wedge cut when you make it, is if you stretch that tissue, and people say, do you want that tear right there? I want that tear. I want to push the wedge cut until I get that tear. Why do I push it until I get that tear? Because that tear says interior tissue damage, not disconnected, but it's been torn and the tree starts going, DEFCON 5, all resources go, 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 go. And everything in the tree right now is going, boom, compartmentalize, start tissue generation, start movement, sugars and starches, move down, let's heal, let's heal, let's patch, let's patch. And that area over the course of this fall is going to really solidify and set in a very short amount of time. It'll take 12 months before I would even consider reducing or removing the, the, the wire, 18 months before I ever will actually remove that rebar, but I would be comfortable in 12 months taking the rebar off, repotting this tree and anchoring it to a point on the trunk instead of the rebar because that will already be relatively set. All right, uh, Treebeard Steve wants to know, so without the pine ability to move resources laterally, this tree would end up disfigured and the death of large chunks of tissue, yes? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, which, is, which is why when everybody's asking about elongating species, I'm sitting here saying, you know, um, maybe you could, but golly, it feels very risky. All right. Um, let's see. Marianne wants to know what kind of cut paste you're using. 
Um, so I am using, this is a good question. Um, I'm using the gray, which is literally called cut paste, uh, the gray putty, boom, 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 right? There's the, the fancy sack of dirty gray putty. Okay, and when, when you open it up, it's all the stuff that sticks to your fingers and you're tempted, you know, it's that stuff, okay? Uh, it comes also in the little cans with the green or the gray top. I think green is conifer, gray is deciduous, or maybe I have that backwards. Okay, and then the liquid, Callismate. We sell this on our website, still the very best uh, cut paste that you can get in terms of liquid. We use this for small tears, small cracks. This will not so stop sap from bleeding, but what it does do is it does cause the tissue to immediately start to produce, heal, compartmentalize, et cetera. This is a beautiful one, okay? Those are the two that I'm utilizing. Uh, Josh wants to know, why is the tree in a pot instead of a grow bag? Or is it in a grow bag inside of the pot? It's a grow bag inside a pot. Ah, okay. Uh, it's a grot. It's a grot. <laughs> uh, I think that's a bad, th that's like a weapon. Is that a bad thing? That's, yeah, it's like a, it's a medieval strangling tool. Oh, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> This ha this this, hap this, ha this happened. This knowledge. This this ha this happened uh, recently with me too, where I like mesh two words, and somebody's like, mm, "I mean something." Yeah, let's like, yeah. not. Let's not. Well, that wasn't that wasn't too bad. Let's not do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, David wants to know what would you have done if the rebar had moved during that operation? Um, yeah, great question, and and it's something that we really, I mean, we dealt with it in spades. Okay, obviously, if the rebar is pulling into the tree. Okay, and it's pulling into the tree, I would have to find a location. And chances are that location would have had to have been against the trunk here. Let me turn so you can see this, okay? If this started to move in here, if this started to move in here, we would have had to have blocked from here to the actual rebar to stop that rebar from moving. And we would have to do it just below the wedge that we cut, which is where it gets complex, right? But that's how you would nullify that application of force so that the rebar couldn't longer, couldn't move towards the tree any longer. I'm so happy it didn't because that's what happened with the last one that we did. And it's just, it really becomes a complex scenario. Um, the greater the force, now that tree required a tremendous amount of force uh, to bend, and it was quite uh, harrowing for the film team to be documenting. Troy and I were both uh, very intensely uh, sweating. I still, you know, even for the even for the fact that it did not survive, I still, to a degree, um, wonder why it didn't. There was enough roots, but the roots didn't didn't just just didn't grow after that. And I'm assuming that there was just a little bit too much trauma and movement in the container, which is. Which we always say, listen, if a tree is moving in the container, it's dying. And that was a really great illustration of that. All right. Uh, Matt says, how do you keep the cut site from swelling? I've done a wedge cut and lots of swelling that really ruins the structure. Um, the tighter that it fits together, the tighter that it's held together, and the longer that it's held together, the less it should swell. So when Treebeard Steve asked, hey, um, what are you going to do about the fact that it's not touching? Well, this is where you talk about not the fact that we can do this kind of bending, but that when we do this kind of bending, how well can you do this type of bending? Because the fact that it didn't perfectly meet means I'm going to have a little bit of swelling there. Am I going to have a lot of swelling? I'm not going to have a lot of swelling. I'm not, I'm not super worried, um, but if I had it perfectly match up, I would have no swelling, right? So oftentimes, and that's where I say, listen, Anybody can bend something heavy, but to bend it heavy and have it look the very best, what are the nuances, what are the techniques, what are the pitfalls, etc. that's when we get into the higher levels of bonsai acumen and execution. And that's one of those places. The tighter that they fit together, the less you see that distortion and that grotesqueness at that junction. Uh, Dane wants to know, why did you do the bend first and then remove the branches? Why not rid of the branches first and then do the bending? Why not get rid of them or move them? Uh, I think that he was talking about, this is from a, way earlier, I uh -huh. think when you were like removing some of the pieces. Oh, oh, um, because I hadn't seen what the bend was gonna give us, right? You, you cannot never, 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 and I'm gonna say this one more time, never make assumptions about what you're going to interpret when you make a dramatic change like this, right? This tree, in that change, changed so much more than I thought it was going to that I really have to give myself the capacity to respond because you remove branches, you bend it, and then you look at it and you're like, shit, I should not have cut that off, right? First thing that will happen, I promise, I promise, every time that you try to proactively anticipate what's going to happen, all of a sudden you get there and you go, ah, he was 
right. Ryan was right. Dang it. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it, he was right again. Dang it. Uh, Dang let's it. see. Um, it's just, we had a couple people who asked um, when you were doing that first Big Ben with that four gauge on the branch on the left, if that teared the shoulder at all while you were doing uh, that. I took it until it just started to tear, and I'll, I'll show you that. Again, so much of bonsai practice um, has been, ooh, don't damage it, ooh, don't tear it, ooh, oh, shoot, I, I, I did something. And it's like, no, 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 hey, 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 hey. Let me let it, you in on a little secret. If you take it until it just starts to tear, again, why is this trunk bin gonna hold so well? Because we took it till it tore. Okay, let me show you this just so that you can see it. I'm gonna just delicately, Jesus, right there, that nice little, a nice little uh, white detail. Let me, let me show, there it is. You can see just the white. See the white on the top of that, right there at the shoulder? I took it until it just started to tear and I stopped, okay? Pine, once when they're young like this, coming out of the field, will tear out at the shoulder very easily. Okay, I take it, I see that, boom, I've torn it, now all the resources. DEFCON 6, go, go, go! That's gonna be patched, that's gonna hold that downward angle far faster, far better, right? So, so there's, there's uh, strategies in bonsai where we move it a little bit each day, Day, right? Move it a little bit, move it a little bit, move it a little bit, and that's a lot. Maybe it's maybe it's like this, right? Each day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get you where you need to go, right? You make that move confident, strong, understanding of the technique, of the physiology of the tree, timing, energy positive. When are we in an active growing season that we can execute this on? Boom! <laughs> See that indication. That's what helps you make that decision. You know what's gonna happen physiologically now. <clears throat> Sets it very quickly. That's how we move a tree forward faster. Now you can take the slow route, right? But on a pine where you have a, a real radical phototropic effect and you have a significant amount of tissue memory, if you don't form a lot of tissue on the side opposite of the bend, if you don't get that slight damage so that this starts to swell and grow, you take that wire off, boom, comes right back up. Right, uh, so Kim wants to confirm, so when you bend down the separation, the shoulder heals. When you bend down, the shoulder heals. Now I'm not, again, there are, there are uh, you know, discussions and techniques in bonsai where you see people uh, intentionally cut the top of the shoulder or intentionally tear it out. I'm not doing that, okay, because you dislodge all of the water conductivity if you tear out the cortex or the central core of that but I am pushing it until I start the tear, and when it starts, I stop. That's where I stop, because now I've inflicted enough damage to know that I'm going to get scar tissue, not so much that I've compromised vascular flow. All right, um, Travis wants to know who makes the smaller of the two saws that you displayed earlier. Ah, um, that is also Kikua. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. Uh, Kikua used to give Mr. Kimura's apprentices at shows very good prices on tools. Uh, and so a lot of my tools used to be Kikua. I don't have a relationship with Kikua anymore, but I don't have anything bad to say. I really like Joshua Roth tools. I use Joshua Roth tools. We vend Joshua Roth tools. I have nothing against Kikua. And I think, um, you know, the I, do I use that saw a lot? No, I don't use that saw. In fact, I probably haven't used that saw in six or seven years. Maybe actually when we did some of the deciduous work. Uh, and we're gonna be coming back. I, I just, just got a smashing Japanese maple that we're gonna come back to and dig into Japanese maple um, this fall. But, uh, but when, when, when we talk about deciduous work, I've used it in, in recent years. Beyond that though, in terms of con conifer work, not something that I've used in a very long time. All right, uh, Treebeard Steve, oh, sorry, next question is from Brady. Uh, when do pine branch tips get laid out? Fully horizontally versus cupped upwards. Great. I thought horizontal was done for all pine tips in development, but on a recent multi-flush pine stream, he said not to do so for single flush pines. I believe that's what was said. Yeah. But I didn't quite follow why was the case. Great question. Just talked about this uh, with my students in, in class this year, okay? Um, when you have an extremely, and this is in response to the tree as well, this is let the tree, this is the tr letting the tree guide the dance, okay? When you have this big, long, um, and I don't even have growth that is that long on this tree, right? I mean, even the big long pieces of growth have kind of isolated their, their strength to the tip. But when you get a multi-flush pine, you get these big long expanses of needles, right? Uh, there is no tip 
there's just a singular candle that you're wiring out for the first time. So there is no needle mass that you go here, you don't pluck all of that off, you lay that down and the high water mobility and that phototropic effect of multi-flush pines uh, radically and rapidly changes the behavior of the tip of that branch. But when we talk single flush pines, they don't typically have that kind of length. If they do have that length to the growth, then we would lay it down flat because that's a very vigorous high water moving tree. But if they don't have that length to the growth, which a lot of times single flush pines will not, then we can go ahead and tip up to get those uh, tips oriented and give them better photosynthetic efficiency. So again, if the tree's got that kind of vigorous growth, it means it's moving a lot of water, it's active, it's very active then we can go ahead and we can lay that down even if it's a single flush pine. That's a developmental state of being, right? But when we have shorter, tighter growth, now it's not moving as much water. It's more in a secondary and even a tree that's never been styled might not have that kind of ridiculous aggressive growth and we may need to tip that up to give it the best photosynthetic capacity. So it's all in relationship to what do those tips look like. Big long candles that have an abundance of needles across a large area, lay it down, okay? Small short inner nodes, needles just at the tip, tip it up. Okay, um, Treebeard Steve wants to know, do you intend for this tree to be a Moyogi or slanting? Moyogi, this will definitely be a Moyogi, right? And now that I'm getting into the apical region, this is where I'm really, the, the, the fact that we've chosen to go back to the right here, okay, and I'm, and I'm just setting structure, um, mm, mm, okay, just setting structure. Let me show you where we're at. It's a little bit compact and compressed right now. I'm gonna uh, orient towards Lonnie's camera, okay? So go ahead and zoom out just a little bit for me, Lonnie. Pull back a little bit, yeah, okay? So now I've pushed this into this negative space here. Let me go ahead and just give you a little bit of space. Okay, now I'm trying to decide, what do I do with this apical region? Now while I'm here, hey Zeus, go ahead and focus on this apex. Orientation-wise, go ahead and pull back and show me this structure right here. Drop down a little bit, yeah, good. Okay, and pull back into this area right here. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, drop it down a little bit more for me. I wanna see this structure. Good, okay, all right. Can you zoom into that for me? Okay, so now we see here that I've got this big four gauge boom. I made this big move forward here, excellent. Now we can see, that's wonderful. Front branch dropping down here, bam. Notice that I have this branch right here. I have a continuation of the thicker piece and I've got this branch right here. There is no possibility that this piece that occurs down lower can be my apex. I have to use this piece. Josh, come back to the front uh, main cam. Okay, so now that piece is actually sitting on the left side of the tree. My apex is moving to the right. This piece that I said sits lower has to go to the back. This has to move to the right to execute the proper orientation and flow of direction. And we may choose to push the apex in a structural element that way. You can never usurp the hierarchy of the branches. Highest structural element will become the apex in a pine because transition of taper is so paramount and important, okay? So let me go ahead and set that. And that'll give us the general layout and structure um, probably gonna spend a little bit of tomorrow finishing this up and we, probably, and, and we should include uh, kind of the updated progression of this in something. That's eight gauge, that's 10, there we go, okay. I've been using eight for 10. A little discombobulated tonight, a little discombobulated. Kind of discombobulated today, honestly. It's a day for it, I, I feel that. Yeah, day, let's go bend a heavy trunk when we're feeling a little bit off of our game. Well, but see, the trunk bend went quite beautifully though. It did, it did. <laughs> the, but, but again, this is where, you know, when you start to say, hey, um, the action of bending the trunk is a fundamental bonsai action. It's a fundamental technique, although we won't put this as a beginner video because that would be catastrophic, right? <laughs> um, in terms of how we rate the technique in our, in our library. But uh, th this, this is, for pines, a very fundamental aspect uh, of pine work, especially if we're going to be dealing with field-grown stock because we have to be able to and, and really be willing and prepared to take the, the, the steps to, to make big moves and change the structure of the tree or else it's very difficult to be able to get any kind of structure that's going to appreciate and improve over the course of time. Okay, so I'm dropping this piece down right here. 
dropping it down, rotating as I drop, okay? Flaring both sides. Now I'm gonna open that up. You see these, I have wonderful pieces to be using as ramification here, right? I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pull this piece that's working in the apex up and over the top. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna carry it out here. I'm not necessarily worried about tipping this piece up because this is a vigorous piece in the apical region like we just talked about. Okay, and now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna flare this over. I'm gonna to try to rotate. Notice this is on the bottom here. This is on the top here. Okay, I've got that crotch and they're sitting here. I wanna rotate so that I pull those up and I actually want the finer of the two to be my apical region. It's tight, it's compact, I've got buds in here. This will be sacrificial. This big long piece will be sacrificial. We do this on the field grown black pines. So I'm just gonna rotate with the wire. Just pull that up. Now notice how that is now sitting laterally. Do you see that? little sleight of hand there, but instead of being down, instead of here, we ro rolled that up and now it's there, okay? Now I get to take a look at how that apex feels in terms of its engagement with this piece, and I think this central piece here needs to go more that way, okay? So I have to be careful because this is now at a point of leverage. I'm gonna use my hands, I'm actually gonna physically use my hands as a lever device. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab that stump right here and I'm gonna pull that piece towards it just so that I have a real <clears throat> calculated force taking it just off of vertical in that direction, right? And now that tips my apex, I have that upward movement here facilitated by the correct rotation. I've got my apical region leaning in that direction. Let me pull this up out of the way so you can kind of see what that looks like, okay? So if I take this up and out of the way, I'm gonna turn it towards Lonnie's camera so that Lonnie can see it, right? Now this is up and I'm gonna go ahead and put a hand right here. That's your apex right there, leaning back towards that branch, getting that nice seated squat compact kind of orientation towards that branch on the right, which is what further compresses this design. Tree starts out with a movement slightly to the right, back to the left, left again, back to the right. We compress this. That it will be a relatively centered apex. When you start to look at this, apex existing here, almost directly over the base, fundamental traditional bonsai design principle. We love the aesthetic. We recognize that there's value in that aesthetic. Japanese white pine playing into that traditional model. It keeps the narrowest, most compressed shape in this, makes a short, stout, powerful white pine. This will be a very impressive chuhin white pine when it's all said and done. Give me five years for it to be showable. Give me eight years for it to reach its highest level of aesthetic for the first time. And this thing's gonna be absolutely stunning. All right, um, Dane wants to confirm, is this a good time to do these kinds of trunk bendings on Japanese black pines as well? Uh, if you have decandled your Japanese black pine and it is in a state of second flush, not a good time. If it's a Japanese black pine in development out of the field, you've been letting it grow, it's strong and healthy, absolutely wonderful time, okay? But if it is producing a second flush, that second flush just hardened off at the middle of September or is just beginning to harden off, for those of us in northern states, we recognize, gosh, middle of September, they still look pretty, pretty young. They still haven't. Yes, it takes all fall for them to fully harden. And we don't want to reduce the needle mass on trees that have been decandled in the multi-flush family yet, right? We we want to give them all of fall to accumulate resources so they grow healthy next year. Not a good time for those, but in development, haven't been decandled, great time to be doing the wedge cut and trunk bends. All right. Um, Miss Mel wants to know, will the tree be protected till spring? Yeah, this will have to be protected. We're right on the cusp. First of October, uh, for me, four to six weeks prior to the first cold event is really when I start to think about heavy work being protected. Uh, November 14th, first cold event in the Pacific Northwest, almost annually. So right at the beginning of October, uh, we're on that cusp. I will protect this for sure. Uh, Kim wants to know, do you let the wire bite as much with white pines and will it grow out eventually? Um, I try to not let the wire bite as much with white pine, right? Uh, black pine, not a problem. Big, heavy bark, very effortless. Red pine, also uh, heavy bark, not worried about it. Scots pine, sylvestris, not an issue. White pine, mm, smoother bark, a little bit softer. Scar lasts for a lot longer if, if we're ever actually able to get rid of it. And, and typically we can, but it does last longer. I try not to let it bite nearly as deep. I still have to let that bite though. I still have to let tissue accumulate or else it's not gonna hold that shape, but I'm more cautious. All right, 
Uh, Sarah says, um, wants to know if you could possibly use the swelling to your advantage to create extra curves when you get uh, swelling from the healing from the trunk cut. Oh, not only could I, I plan on it. I plan on it. That is a part of getting that tear because then that's gonna swell and it actually, there's physiological things that happen and there's aesthetic things that happen. It causes, when that swells, it causes that bend to be exaggerated slightly by the swelling of that tissue. Um, but beyond that, it causes that to, to, to pooch out a little bit on that backside and exacerbates that, that uh, angularity. Um, and then in addition to that, it holds, it holds it better. And, and what you'll see are the guy wires that are tied to the rebar here will completely have no force on them because that swelling in pushing that reduces all of the tension on the guy wire and they just let go. They just let go. The tree has now grown into and past the bend and that's when you know that you're safe to remove the wire. Uh, Sylvia wants to know, can you still do this in early November? Um, not as ideal of a time. Now, the warmer the region that you live in, the more possible that is. Southern California, sure. Gulf of Texas, absolutely. Florida, why not, okay? But when we start talking about, mm, you know, the, the areas of the southeastern United States where it's freezing, not a good idea. Uh, the northern portions of California, Oregon, Washington, um, areas where we experience actual winter, very bad idea. You always want to do this type of operation, big wedge cuts, early spring before the tree starts growing, or uh, early, early portion of fall as it's producing vascular tissue just prior to a major flush of growth is when you have the best chance of making the most severe action and having the tree respond very positively. Uh, November, just prior to dormancy, worst time to be doing this. All right, and our last question is from Rafi. Rafi uh, was thinking of the apex going to the left and instead you chose the right. So they wanna know um, why a apex going to the left would be of lesser value. Not of lesser value. No, no, no. I asked, I asked uh, the chat, I said, uh, does the tree return to the right or does the tree move out to the left? The chat said, let's go traditional. Let's return to the right, create the most compact, most tight, sort of closed down, meaty little massive pine, right? And that's what we did. Because if we came to the left, this piece kicks out, we get more flow, we get more uh, asymmetry, apex comes to the left to work with that, and that starts to elongate the design a little bit, right? We soften that uh, execution. So when we compress there, and we compress there, and we pushed in here, that really focused all of that visual energy into that small space. This is traditional bonsai design for a powerful pine, and that was the direction we went, and we talked about that connotation with this being a Japanese white pine that has some born-in aesthetic. I'm totally open. You could have gone either way, though. There's, there's no way that has lesser value. Two different aesthetics. All right, that's all our questions for this uh, evening. Um, you know, bittersweet. Bittersweet to work on this tree. Uh, Chris and Lisa have been huge. Uh, there's still a GoFundMe out there for Roxy, uh, who also lost everything as, as the, the, the real centrifuge of Telperion Farms. Um, Gary Wood started that for her. We've contributed. I would invite you to contribute as well, because Roxy needs our help as much as Chris and Lisa. But... You know, the, the, I think the, the, the beautiful thing about bonsai is that you have this perpetuation of people's passion and energy that exists in these time capsules that are these tiny trees, right? Uh, and it is, again, bittersweet, but also special to know that there are parts of Telperion Farm that are going to live on in a lot of our collections across North America, and there's gonna be an influence that lives on on an international level. So, you know, I think we all have gratitude for what they've done for uh, bonsai in North America and the influence they've had, but um, really nice to get to collaborate together as a community. You know, pay a little homage, uh, understand that, that we've gotta cherish those opportunities with people that are important to us, that are doing special things and contributing to this art form, and uh, you know, Everybody make sure, make sure that, that, that we understand that it's, it's a rare moment when we do have these special people around. So value them, okay? We value you. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your night. We'll see you tomorrow on the mini stream. Identification of issues. How do you work through that logic? Q&A's on Thursday. Mariah, on and on and on. Love you guys. Mwah!